Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. The Obama gang says you can stick your transparency where the sunshine week doesn't shine. But first, a new poll shows C-51 support rapidly declining. So briefly, Bill C-51 is Canada's Anti-Terrorism Act 2015, meant to fix a bunch of Canadian laws so the populace can be better surveilled. So via our man Dan Dix at Press for Truth, despite various polls and articles coming out to suggest that Canadians are growing in their support for C-51, it looks like the situation is quite the opposite. So following a National Day of Action against Bill C-51 back on March 14th, where thousands of people took to the streets in protest, the results of a new survey suggest that the Canadian people are not buying into the fear rhetoric like the Harper administration would like them to. The forum research poll demonstrated that support for the bill now stands at roughly 45%, whereas earlier polls suggested that approval was around 82%, and that approval is expected to drop even further. From law professors and former Canadian prime ministers to security experts and human rights advocates, many good people in Canada are concerned about the bill and about the sanctity of due process in the country, a value which C-51 would aim to erode. So unfortunately, as Dan Dix notes, one of the biggest obstacles in getting people to appreciate the fruitlessness that is Bill C-51 is that fear resides in many people's lives. Even though many people don't feel confident about the bill, the same poll showed that two-thirds of the people still think we should give the cops the power to investigate terrorism in any way they see necessary. They believe this despite there being any evidence to suggest or demonstrate how giving them even more power than they already have would make them do a better job than they're already doing right now. So one of the clear reasons that people feel like giving more power to the police is because of the ISIS-induced fear that mainstream corporate media perpetually showing them gruesome murders and bullying them to always live in afraid of some elusive future terror attack. James will include links so people can read more about Bill C-51. Look at all of those day of action protests that happened across Canada. And I guess we'll sort of call this a glass half full story, James. I think that's pretty much the best we can uh, squeeze out of this. It is good to know that people's opposition to C-51 is rising, but exactly as that article notes, it is, of course, framed not only within the Canadian, growing Canadian war on terror uh, propaganda meme that they've been pushing for for years now, but also, as uh, Dan Dix notes in one of his recent videos, uh, the a lot of the protests are being steered in a, 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 a left version of the left-right duopoly of uh, of control so that all of the protests become against anti-Harper. Oh, it's, you know, it's Harper's C-51 bill. We have to get rid of Harper. And of course, we're being set up for the 2015 Canadian election where the rising star, the Obama of the North, is going to be Justin Trudeau. And uh, that is, uh, he's already expressed support for C-51. So uh, again, nothing is going to change whatsoever within that phony controlled left-right paradigm in Canada or the US or anywhere else. So I I think we have to be wary of the way that the opposition to Bill C-51 can be steered into a trap where we're going to get the exact same thing from just a different face of the the control grid. Um, So yes, half full in the sense that people are at least wary of what's going on with this bill, um, but there still needs to be more education, and they're not. People generally aren't going to get it at the types of protests that are going on, unless people who do understand what's going on throw themselves into that mix and start informing others about some of this other excluded information about various uh, Canadian terror plots that have been exposed as being uh, a hoax of uh, full of tissue full of lies. Um, FBI informants in Canadian terror plots, other types of things that have come out along the way. We'll throw in some uh, links in the show notes so that people can check that out for themselves. And as I say, inform others about these issues, because I, I still I still trust that most Canadians, when they really understand the truth, will not go along with either the left or the right arms of this controlled uh, phony opposition. 
James, did this get built up in that recent Canadian terror attack? Did C-51 sort of rise in, in, in the public's mind after that happened? If I remember correctly, I believe it was retabled in the Parliament just days after that occurred. Or at, at any rate, I remember the stories coming out talking about this bill and why it was so important. So yes, it, absolutely, that gave a little shot in the arm to this whole terror meme. So again, uh, deconstructing the terror myths is an important part of stopping this type of legislation from proceeding. Let's continue to deconstruct myths on this 223rd episode of New World Next Week, James, and I think your point about the faces might change, but the the agenda kind of rolls forward. Let's roll forward to our second story this week. White House not subject to FOIA requests anymore. The White House... That's back here in the States, in the, the soon-to-be North American Union. The, the White House is removing a federal regulation that subjects its Office of Administration to the Freedom of Information Act, making official a policy under Presidents Bush and Obama to reject requests for records to that office. The White House said the cleanup of FOIA regulations is consistent with court rulings that hold that the office is not subject to the transparency law. The office handles, among other things, White House record-keeping duties like the archiving of emails. But the timing of the move raised eyebrows among transparency advocates coming on National Freedom of Information Day and during a national debate over the preservation of Obama administration records. It's also Sunshine Week. Mar the week of March 16th is always Sunshine Week, an effort by news organizations and watchdog groups to highlight issues of government, quote-unquote, transparency. The irony of this being at Sunshine Week is not lost on me. It's completely out of step with the president's supposed commitment to transparency. It's a critical office, especially if you want to know, for example... How the White House is dealing with email, said Ann Weissman of the Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, or CREW. So you might remember CREW from 2007, and you might remember them from last week's episode of The New World Next Week as we discussed the Bush White House email scandal. That would be when CREW sued the White House over emails that they deleted, 22 million of them. And the White House and the Bush Cheney crime gang first started to comply with the request, but then reversed course. James, one of the other things we discovered on this Sunshine Week, in addition to not only are they exempting themselves from FOIA requests, but the Obama administration sets even a new record for denying and censoring government files. James, change you can classify. <laughs> Yeah, indeed. And the irony of this occurring in Sunshine Week will not be lost on those long old timers in the crowd who remember that in Sunshine Week 2011, a bunch of government transparency groups, these uh, foundation funded uh, government uh, watchdogs, quote unquote, grouped together to give Obama a transparency award for his commitment to opening up the government. At the last minute, and that, that uh, award was going to be bestowed in Sunshine Week, of course. That uh, appointment was cancelled at the last minute and rescheduled as an off-the-record secret behind-closed-door meeting that Obama granted these uh, government watchdog groups to accept his transparency award. If you want more details on that, I, that was the, uh, the issue that I covered in the first ever edition of the Eye Opener Report back in 2011 called Obama's Hypocrisy. And uh, in that note, in that uh, 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 video, we noted the, that some of the people who were involved in giving Obama his transparency award, like Joe Newman of the Project on Government Oversight, who said, I think we've made it clear that the president has shortcomings when it comes to transparency, but I'd also challenge any impartial observer to refute the fact that he has made significant strides in opening up the government, especially when compared to his predecessor. And we had Tom Blanton of the National Security Archive said, I believe their opposition, the people who uh, were against the, um, th this award being given to Obama, I believe their opposition is misplaced and they need to be more precision guided in their advocacy. Know thy enemy. Obama is not their enemy. Um, well, I would just like to shove those words back in the faces of those foundation-funded, uh, uh, corporate-controlled uh, watchdog groups that gave this award to this 
absolutely ridiculously classified tyrannical regime that has obviously failed to live up to any expectation and trampled all over it exactly as we said they were going to. I wonder if these people will eat crow and realize that they have given an award to one of the most secretive uh, regimes that has ever taken office in the White House, and that's saying something. So, uh, again, it is ridiculous. It is not at all surprising to anyone who has their head screwed on straight, and it needs to be shoved in the faces of the Obama supporters who fell for this crap the first time. So we'll include a couple of related notes, James, I think, that go along with this story, but also, I think, segue us into our third and final story this week. So John Brennan, longtime crony criminal, he's now head of the CIA. He made a note earlier this week, and it was kind of hidden. There was a lot of interesting, big, showy things in the news this week, while some of the more important stories kind of flew under the radar. And again, that's what I think we try and uncover in our own way here. CIA says social media amplifies the terror threat. So what are they going to do? They're going to spy even more on your social media, your Facebook and your tweets and all of that. Again, showing you they'll hide everything from themselves, but ours is all out in the open. And, and you know, and even as I'm kind of thinking about this, it's always about this sort of misdirection. Because as I'm referring to, you know, kind of the bigger kind of showy stories this week, James, there was this big event where a, a murder was was busted here in the States, a guy named Robert Durst, and he allegedly murdered three people over the course of, of several decades. And he's a bizarro millionaire, and they had been doing this HBO series about him. And lo and behold, they arrest the guy on the night of the season finale of The Jinx on HBO. Amazing timing. And I just found it really interesting how good multinational corporations are showing one nut job who maybe killed three people, but they're not good at exposing institutional murder of millions of people that their own sort of corporations and moves kind of help to kind of push along. So while everybody was talking about the jinx, they weren't noticing that their change alluya savior was making things much, much more secret and essentially deleting emails just like Hillary, just like we talked about last week, James. So let's move with having said all that to our third and final story this week, James. I'll file this under our good news. And again, this might be a glass half full. This might be a not unmitigated good, but an interesting one nonetheless. Cisco will start shipping to fake addresses to dodge NSA spies and thieves. This comes via the UK register. Cisco will ship boxes to vacant addresses in a bid to foil the NSA, their security chief, John Stewart, said. The dead drop shipments helped to foil a Snowden revealed operation whereby the NSA would intercept networking kits and install back doors before the boxes reached the customers. So this interception campaign was revealed last May. But speaking at a Cisco Live press panel in Melbourne just this past week, Cisco security head Stewart said they'll ship to fake identities for its most sensitive customers in the hope that the NSA interceptions are targeted. We ship boxes to an address that has nothing to do with the customer, and then you have no idea who it's ultimately going to. When customers are truly worried, it causes other issues to make interception more difficult in that agencies don't quite know where that router is going, so it's hard to target. You'd have to target all of them, and there's always going to be that inherent risk, they noted. Stewart says some customers drive up to a distributor and pick up the hardware at the door. He says nothing could guarantee protection against the NSA. However, if you had a machine in an airtight area, I stop the controls by which I mitigate risk when I ship it, meaning as soon as it leaves the building, well, I can't control what's, what's going to happen to it before it hits the customer. Cisco's poked around its routers for possible spy chips, but to date hasn't found anything because they don't really know what they're looking for. And again, we've reported here in recent weeks about the fact that most of your hard drives already have NSA backdoors kind of put on them. So after this hacking campaign was discovered, Cisco head John Chambers wrote a letter to U.S. President Barack Obama saying the spying would undermine the global tech industry, which is an interesting one and a uh, cart before horse kind of thing, James. Perhaps the global tech industry is built on spying? Uh, yeah. 
basically. Yeah. And and this is one of those stories I would just love to be able to just get someone who's still in this matrix to look at this story and tell me what they think about it. Because to my mind, nothing, literally nothing I can think of is more in your face tyrannical than to have corporations out in the open saying we are doing all of this crazy stuff behind the scenes, this 007 type of stuff to try to avoid the government spying, which we now know and have to admit is going on behind the scenes, but we don't even know what to look for, so we don't know how to change what we're doing. I mean, it's insanity that this is happening and that corporations are at least having to openly address this. Of course, we know that they're still working behind the scenes with the NSA hand in glove, but that's largely because if you try to go against it, like the CEO of Quest, you're going to get thrown in jail for uh, whatever trumped up charges. So it's just, I mean, this is total insanity. This is nightmare tyrannical stuff. And I don't understand. I truly can't imagine how anyone can defend this on anything other than a, oh, but it's only this president. If we just got a new puppet into power, we could, we could solve all of that. Just like getting Obama into power after Bush solved everything, right? Oh, wait, everything continued exactly as before. This is the system writ large. But don't worry, Obama has a solution. I don't know if you saw this, but uh, the latest news, Obama wants to to make v voting mandatory. So, boy, that'll solve all of America's problems, won't it? Well, and just like Oregon leads the nation in a lot of ways, they've actually just put that in here. So when you get a drive, it automatically sort of registers you to vote. You have to sort of opt out of it. Now, that's an interesting kind of element, but it, it is kind of happening. We'll see it roll out. James, if I can add in sort of other good news notes, and we do try and, and focus on good news here and solutions-oriented elements, and we've upped that game in 2015. And you can submit good news stories to us using hashtag good news next week. Two notes, a bill would give Maine customers a final say on water fluoridation. That was submitted via Real Jack Dallas. And World Changing Me notes that thousands of farmers have been demonstrating in Delhi, India against GM crops and anti-farmer policies. And those protesters are now wondering if Prime Minister Modi maybe came to power with the help of Big Ag. As always, you can submit stories to us via Twitter using hashtag classic New World Next Week. We'll note Australia joins China's regional bank. Moscow launches a new exchange to facilitate trade between China and Russia, and the Federal Reserve plans their first rate hike since the 2008 controlled demolition of the fake economy. And finally, James, America's most important selection happened this week, as it always does in, in Israel, as both Netanyahu and we even saw the New York Times both backpedaling on their pre-election threats against a Palestinian state. The New York Times published a piece about Netanyahu's racism, then rewrote the whole thing. And you can see those screen grabs. And if you follow Media Monarchy on Twitter and submit stories using hashtag New World Next Week, 